while you're no longer in public life uh, in the parliament, uh, you are still in the public life of ideas. And I have to say it was wonderful to have you back in the public square in recent times, uh, talking about the need for values in our public life, talking about the need for commitment in our public life and talking about the idea of public life as a form of vocation, as a calling, not as a career, as a life of service, not a life of self-advancement. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our good friend, John Anderson, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. Tony, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. I well remember that day. We didn't start in Murrunda, we started in Scone. I say that because we were going to Corindai, it's 80 kilometres. Uh, and uh, we did indeed, though, stop for a coffee at uh, uh, Murrunda at the bottom of the range. There's a four and a half kilometre climb. I know exactly how long it is then over the range. And what Tony didn't tell you was that all the television cameras turned up at Murrundi. And I learnt something. You always learn something when you go for a ride with Tony Abbott. I learnt that day just how slowly a Holden Commodore station wagon can go. Because they followed me up the mountain, or rather they tracked me, two of them, with cameras out the back door, hoping to catch on record the Prime Deputy Prime Minister of Australia expiring. And I'm sure... <laughs> In, the, in their minds, they were hoping it would be permanent. Uh, and it meant that I couldn't get off and push. I had to ride all the way to the top because Tony's uh, gilding the lily. He's always been fitter than me. I was moderately fit in those days, but he was very fit. And I can tell you, it was a heck of a climb. I did resign shortly after that. It freed me up to... Uh, they're not related, those two events. It did free me up, though, to uh, do some family things. And I remember... Uh, I've always felt indebted to Tony because he said a couple of things in that final speech in the Parliament when people were very kind that I'd particularly appreciated and I've always wanted to say, Tony, you were very generous to me that day, I've always appreciated it. A couple of days after that the Parliament got up and my son had secured himself a spot at Gordonston on exchange for four months and I said to Julia, I can go with him. And while we're there, we'll go and see where your family came from in Scotland and take him to where my family came from. So we ended up in Oban, which is where my mob came from in 1838. Uh, and uh, we were staying in a little bed and breakfast, a uh, lovely hot breakfast, I love hot breakfast, in this little bed and breakfast. We went down the next morning into the little crowded dining room, took a table, my son and I, who was 15, just about to go to Gordonston, and two retired Australians came in and they obviously hadn't been tracking the news. And the fellow who would have been about 75 sees me, his jaw drops, he says to his wife, that's John Anderson over there, what do you think he's doing in this bed and breakfast in Oban? And he said to our hostess, was, who was a very short, very dour and very stocky little Scottish lady with zero expression on her face, What's the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia doing staying in your bed and breakfast? Nothing registered on the face. He said, that man over there with the boy, who's probably his son, that's the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia. What's he doing here in your bed and breakfast? Zero reaction on the face. He says, madam, that fella over there, what's he doing here? How do you come to have him as your guest? To which she replied, do you want your eggs poached or fried? <laughs> <coughs> So I was uh, brought back down to earth very quickly. <laughs> I wanted to put some serious thoughts to you this morning. That's by way of apologising for the fact that I'm going to refer to some notes because I've spent a bit of time thinking about what I'd like to say. So I hope you'll bear with me. When two or more are gathered, the question of trust immediately arises. Where trust is present, Harmony, cooperation and mutual advancement flourish. But when it's not present or when it's broken, cooperation becomes harder, all parties are diminished and freedom will very often be sacrificed in a flight 
for safety and security. And these realities apply to families, they apply to communities, they apply to nations and they apply internationally. Now I want to say to you that in this country that every one of us loves, we face a serious array of very real challenges. Many are domestic, many are international. They all require us to respond if we believe in ourselves. There are some very serious economic threats. Some of them are in our power to address here domestically. Others require us to sandbag ourselves against international influences. The fact is that the global debt crisis of a decade or so ago has not been resolved. It's just been kicked down the road by the taking on of staggering amounts of further debt. And attempting to solve a debt with more debt does not solve the problem. In addition, many Western economies, and we now know China, not only face truly frightening debt levels, they also have truly insurmountable unfunded future liabilities. One way or another, there will be, and it is likely to be, a serious global downturn at some point in the future. And this time, for a variety of reasons, we will not be insulated. I find it amazing that despite all the warning signs and despite the blessing of having got through the last one being largely unaffected, we will not as a people pull together to prepare and to sandbag ourselves. We have managed on a topic that Tony's been talking about to place our economic competitiveness in real danger and create real social stress for many less well-off Australians by doubling and in some cases tripling electricity prices in a decade. Cheapest electricity in the OECD when we left office, now amongst the most expensive and sometimes the least reliable. And all that for little, if any, environmental advantage. In common now with many other Western countries, we are frankly engaging in intergenerational theft. Not only by refusing to pay our way as we borrow irresponsibly, but by an emerging stripping out of our future middle classes. It threatens our young. They will be very angry and they realise not only have we left our generation, left them with huge debts, by trying to resolve those debt problems uh, and creating inflation, we've driven up asset prices while real wages continue to flatline. It will, that's probably why 92% of young Australians in a recent Deloitte Commission study uh, indicated that they don't believe they'll have the same opportunities that their parents and grandparents had. Meanwhile, for far too many of the children of tomorrow that I'm talking about here are doing it tough right now. Have you noticed that we are making them victims in our adults' culture war with smashed families, serious father hunger that can't be papered over? It's a reality for far too many of our children. We've got declining educational outcomes despite the money that we're throwing at it. We have serious problems with mental health and depression in amongst our children, and I'm told some of the worst youth suicide rates in the world. Add to that, we live in a rapidly changing global environment. The unipolar global order that we've taken for granted since the collapse of the Berlin Wall, whereby the Americans will play cop and we can spend more money on social programs and less on defence, is coming to an end. We now face a very different multipolar and very much more dangerous world out there. For the first time in our history, I put it to you, that we face the prospect of not being able to automatically assume that the world's most powerful nation is on our side and can be counted upon. And Tony's spoken very eloquently about that recently in Washington. I commend that remarkable speech to you. I put it to you that if we believe in ourselves, as our forefathers did, we'd be taking these issues much more seriously. In a recent recorded uh, conversation, Neil Ferguson, the world's leading economic historian, told me that in his view there are three great threats confronting the West's freedom. And he said, in ascending order, they are firstly radical Islam and its intents. Secondly, the possibility, even probability, of miscalculation between the superpower and the rising superpower. But thirdly, he said, the greatest threat, and the one if we could only and would only address it, would help us resolve the others, is that we no longer believe in our own culture. We've forgotten our history. 
we do not understand who we are, we, do know not know, we don't know what we have and why we should value it properly and defend it. The West denies its past, it denies its achievements, it surrenders its advantages, it loathes its origins, it is fast losing faith in itself, overwhelmingly, because we don't know our history. And as we know, Tony, there are plenty of people who, determ who are determined that we should not know our history. Witness the reactions to the proposed Ramsey Centre for the study of Western civilization. We should never forget that those who control the past shape the future. As no lesser figure than Karl Marx observed, a people without knowledge of their history are easily persuaded. They'll fall for anything. Let me focus for a moment on Ferguson's main point. We still, if we want to exercise it, have control over our destiny. We've not been overcome by external forces. The enemy is not marching over the hill, at least not yet, for all the worrying global uncertainties. We remain the freest, best educated, most innovative, most powerful and yet most peaceful of all civilizations. It may not be perfect, but we've written a better book, a better story on freedom and opportunity for our citizens than any other culture down through the age, ages. And we have, for all the undoubted failings, nobody pretends that we've got it all right in the past or even today, but nonetheless, for all that, we've done a great deal of good in the world. One powerful example, which I find quite compelling, is that lifespans in the developing world have been doubled with Western know-how, agricultural expertise and medicine. So my friends, why will we not defend so much that is good? Why we are, are we apparently unable to address the array of policy problems that confront us? Why will we not act in concert to secure our culture? Must we eat ourselves out from within, as Malcolm Mugridge put it? And as the great Oxford historian Arnold Toynbee argued, was the real fate of, all of almost all of the great cultures down through the ages? Now, many of the issues before us are undoubtedly challenging from a policy perspective. But in common with that remarkable writer that I commend to you, if you can get onto his trail, David Brooks, he writes for the New York Times, I've come to believe that our primary problem now is in fact cultural. He wrote in January this year in the New York Times that, and I quote, if you have 60 years of radical individualism and ruthless meritocracy, you're going to end up with a society that is atomized, distrustful and divided. And that's what we seem to have become in Australia, to the point where we seem no longer able to engage in the sound, respectful debate that is the only pathway to good policy. And we need good policy on a vast array of fronts right now. One thing I can say to you is that I recognise a serious rainfall deficit when I see one. I'm a farmer from northwest New South Wales. Our records show that we're experiencing the worst seasonal conditions since 1902 uh, or 1946, which is even before my time. But there's another deficit, another crippling deficit that I recognise in our land. It's trust in the system. And the research tells you that this collapse of trust is very serious indeed in this country. The Australian National University mightn't like the idea of studying Western civilizations, but it's pretty good at maths. And they've been tracking our collapse into deep distrust. Never before on their research have so many people believed that people in government look after themselves. Never before have so few Australians believed that people in government can be trusted. And furthermore, the surge in confidence that used to accompany a new government, most notably in 1996 and, nine, and 2007, no longer occurs. The, dust, the distrust simply continues unabated. And I have to say that recent turmoil in Canberra will hardly have helped, nor will the Banking Royal Commission, and nor did the Child Sexual Abuse Inquiry. We increasingly lack trust and confidence in the institutions and in the people in them that have undergirded our freedoms and our cherished way of life, and that includes the media, academia, 
even our sportsmen and women and their organisations. When people in a free society lose trust in the system, they start to flee for safety. They look for security over freedom. When they perceive that others will not do what they ought to do without coercion, they'll seek to find ways to protect themselves. We see this writ large in Canberra. We've reached the point when the Australian people now elect a government, they then act to prevent it from governing effectively by jamming the system via the Senate. Why? We seem to have reached the point where very large numbers of Australians take out insurance against the very government that they elect out of belief that they can't trust it to do the job that they put it there to do. And when this banking inquiry is wrapped up, there will be a political race, a political clamour of enormous proportions. You can see it coming now to see who can place the most onerous and populist restrictions on the financial sector because there will be a mood to impose laws to make them do what they should have done by virtue of their own moral compass. But we know from history that these new and almost certainly restrictive and expansive laws and regulations will likely not only be expensive, they will be negative for economic growth. We all lose. The energy policy debacles of the last 10 years give us at least three valuable insights into how things in terms of trust break down. Firstly, governments have looked incompetent and as though they've not known what they were doing or understood the impact on people. That incompetence undermines trust. The second is that politicians have plainly been reluctant to explain the real consequences of their decisions and have consistently tried to deny the obvious truth, which is that there is no such thing as a free lunch and dishonesty undermines truth, trust. The third is that it is perfectly obvious that there have been politicians supported by many in the so-called elite circles of this land who have used climate change concerns as a stalking horse for their desire to undermine free enterprise and our economic prosperity. It should never be forgotten that the leader of a significant Australian political party, Christine Milne, actually publicly argued that dishonesty in public life can be justified when it serves a greater environmental good. My friends, when leaders argue that the ends justify the means, there is no basis for trust in those leaders. Now the major point to be made here, actually, is not so much the point about whether you agree on policy or not, it's quite legal for political leaders to be against our way of life and to hold to their views and ideologies. The point to be made is this, when they don't level with the electors, they themselves drive the very mistrust that seriously threatens our governability. If politicians believe that destabilising or deindustrialising the Australian economy in order to decarbonise it is more important than an Australian's job, they need to go and say that eye to eye to the Australian who's going to lose that job and explain why decarbonising is more important than that job. Integr integrity is in integral to trust and trust is integral to a functioning democracy. I have to say to you I find it very disturbing as a farmer that it is only now as we debate the Paris Agreement that we are starting to glean that for all the turmoil to date the fact is that even though electricity generation has made the lion's share of the contribution to emissions reductions in this country, that sector is not projected to make anything like the 26 to 28 per cent reduction that's been committed. This raises the huge question, will we see even further massive unpredictability in the power generation sector? Or will attention turn to other sectors such as agriculture and transport? And I myself now feel very distrustful. No one spelt out clearly what these two sectors, both of which I once represented in the parliament, both of which are of vital personal importance to me and to many other Australians, and I would put it to you to the economy. We've not been yet alerted to the fact that on the current course, you'd have to be suspicious that we may face precisely the same sort of policy debacles and resultant crippling cost increases that we've seen in the electricity space. 
Instead, we've heard endless reassurances that we will not be troubled. And I'm sorry, I have to say to you, I now find myself, myself in the ranks of the distrustful. Will someone please tell me just what Paris is really going to mean for other sectors of the Australian economy? Let me return then to David Brooks's argument that our problem is mainly cultural. I believe that the institutions of a free, democratic society bequeathed to us by our forebears like ours is actually fully capable of providing us with the machinery we need to secure our future. But I have to say to you that I'm not sure that we have the necessary cultural depth and commonality of purpose now as a nation to use that machinery properly. This, I think, is the great challenge before us. Consider these words, can I say, uh, from a gnat, from a great liberal. You may have heard of him. His name was Bob Menzies. And I quote directly, Democracy is more than a machine. It is a spirit. It is based upon the Christian conception that there is in every human soul a spark of the divine, that with all their inequalities of mind and body, the souls of men stand equal in the sight of God. Now, ironically, the almost complete now mocking of God out of the public square has left us with a massive hole in the foundational pillars of Western secular government. It is this. On what basis now do we build the respect for the dignity and the worth of each of our citizens that is the absolutely critical bulwark against a return to the law of the jungle in place of the rule of law and the resultant breakdown in trust that if we are not very careful will render our civil society broken. We see daily now the denial of universalism, the idea that we're all Australians together, that we should focus on the things that unite us more than the things that divide us. We see less and less a celebration of our shared humanity, once, I might add, a noble goal of many left leaders, even if their policy prescriptions were so wrong, as identity politics raise up new aristocracies and continues to demonise good Australian citizens everywhere. So friends, I want to say to you, I believe we face an extraordinary battle for the soul of our culture. The only answer, it seems to me, to the breakdown of trust is for courageous men and women everywhere to be trustworthy and to be transparently and undeniably trustworthy in the eyes of all who are searching for trustworthiness. Because I deeply believe that a very large number, I hope still a clear majority of Australians, are desperately keen to be, if I can put it this way, surprised by authenticity and trustworthiness in our public square. This is going to require the most extraordinary courage, especially when those who hate, I'm deeply disturbed by the level of hate now in our society, have found such a powerful weapon in social media, which Neil Ferguson regards as so powerful that it may yet make our democratic societies ungovernable. He's written a book on it, I've commended to you, called The Square and the Tower. But the wise understand consequences and the courageous will speak out about those consequences. They always have. And every one of us now, I believe, as we, if we care about our country, must ask ourselves not what we want to do so much as what should we do, what can we do in order that as citizens of this still wonderful country, we can help it refind its feet. And Tony, I want to say to you, you're a man of unique personal modesty a characteristic I value hugely in, in men and women, and of prodigious intelligence with much to contribute to the national debate. I mentioned, for example, your recent speech in Washington. It should be read by every Australian who's concerned for our future. It is a beautifully argued piece of reasoning, and it ought to be studied and understood and debated and not put under the carpet. There will, of course, Tony, always be those who want to silence some of the things that need to be said. 
I was struck the other day by recalling that Lord Reith at the BBC sought to limit Churchill's voice in the 1930s. How unwise he was. But Tony, no one doubts your courage. My only plea is this. As you said, we've known one another a long time. I know you as one who indeed understands the need to respect the dignity and worth of all. In fact, your current role in the government as an envoy for our Indigenous Australians reflects your deep commitment to these noble principles. Now, you've been through a challenging time, as you just said yourself. Can I just say this? Please ensure that to the greatest degree possible that the Australian people know what I, who have known you for now a very long time, know is true about you. You are on their side, you are on our side, even when we have disagreements about how best to take ourselves forward. You can play a major role in rebuilding that trust and with it our national ability to speak properly and to listen properly to one another again. Tony, thank you for having me. Well, John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we've had a lot of speakers over the years at Ringer Community Forum Breakfast, but I doubt that we have had a more down-to-earth yet deep speech than that which we've just heard from our former Deputy Prime Minister.